The following is the audio from a NAFA webinar originally broadcast on October 21st, 2020, titled Understanding ASHRAE's Recommendations on Filtration and Disinfection for COVID-19. The webinar was presented by Kathleen Owen, Fellow of ASHRAE, and moderated by NAFA board member Mike Corbett, CAFS. You can find the link to the slides and the video recording in the show notes of your podcast player and on nathahq.org. Look for the COVID-19 menu dropdown. The recording started a bit late, so you'll join Mike's intro of Kathleen in progress. Enjoy. Standard 52.2, uh, uh, previous chair of ASHRAE Standard 145, dealing with gases contaminants. Um, uh, also a voting member of ASHRAE Standard 185, which deals with uh, evaluation of UVC devices. Uh, she currently is on is the vice chair of ASHRAE's uh, filtration and disinfection subcommittee on the uh, epidemic task force. Uh, she is previously with uh, Research Triangle Institute as a researcher. She's currently with uh, the founder Owens Air Consulting. In 2019, she received uh, she became part of the Ash, uh, ASHRAE Fellowship, and she's also in 2019 received ASHRAE Distinguished Service Award. So. Kathleen, thank you for taking the opportunity to speak with us today. I will also take myself off and mute myself, and I'll come back on when you're done. We'll take some questions uh, afterward, but we'll hold questions until the end. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone, for having me today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the basically the things I think are inter would be interesting to NAFA from the filtration disinfection portion of the epidemic task force. Um, to start off, the Epidemic Task Force is something that ASHRAE founded back in March, so just this year. It's led by former ASHRAE President Bill Bonfleth. Um, the purpose of the group was to try to coalesce the information that's out there or was out there in the incoming information and put it together in ways that we could put out as guidelines or advice to people that were needing to have information in a, one location they could look for. So we're partnering with, diff with different organizations and we're pulling in information, reviewing it, organizing it, um, and trying to update the recommendations as, as reasonable early on. That was often. Now it's more like every few weeks or even a month. Um, if, you, if you go to the, this web address or if you just Google ASHRAE and COVID-19, and click on the link, you'll get to this page. Down at the bottom is filtration disinfection. So you can find us really easily. There are at least this many groups and 140 some people working in the epidemic task force. I think there's 17 voting members. I'm not one of them. Um, I'm currently mostly working with the filtration disinfection group, but I'm also working with um, the research group and sometimes with the schools group. So they like to keep us busy. So this is not information that's specifically on the, the website in this form. And I know most of the NAFA folks will already know this basic information, but when you're thinking about why would we use a filter? Why would we use an air cleaner? What we have is we start off with particles come from a lot of sources like this um, young woman, um, assumedly coughing because the this, this stuff is coming out of her mouth, but, um, from COVID, the particles that we're looking at are mostly from sneezing, coughing, breathing, singing, pretty much anything that can come out of your nose or your mouth. Um, the virus itself, I have seen citations for 70 to about 120 nanometers. And lately I've seen a couple of them that say that might even be a little bit smaller, but that's the individual virus particle, which in general is not what people sneeze out. Actually, I don't think they can. Humans, when they sneeze, cough, sing, add saliva or sputum or other gunk, including you know, multiple viruses in the same particle. But what happens is when these kind of big blobs come out when you're coughing, um, they dry down really fast. The ones that are really big fall to the ground and that's where that six foot suggested distancing is. That is that's where most of the big stuff that would splash on you, get you get your mask wet, that sort of stuff would fall out. The rest of the things will dry down to much smaller particles that can stay in the air. Um, it, this drying is usually rapid. It can be seconds to minutes, um, depending on what the particle is made of and the temperature and the humidity. Um, 
And we definitely have recent studies, relatively recent, showing that the virus and its RNA are in particles in the air. And I believe there's been some since I put the slide together that show the actual virus. One of the tricky things is that culturing the virus from the air is trickier than culturing the RNA. So that's what people looked for first. And my little graphic is just showing a big particle with one little virus in it, but getting smaller and smaller over time. So why does this matter? Well, the pink oval is the coronavirus by itself. The dark pink um, almost purple is what the size of the particles that the COVID is likely to be in the air. And there is some argument over this. This is my personal belief, having read quite a few scientific papers, but I believe that most of it is in the one to four micron range. I was saying one to three, but I saw another paper just a couple days ago showing some above three. Um, so filters, and most of you would know this, but the filtration mechanisms depend on the size of particles. So if you've got particles in the gas stream in air going through a filter, the biggest particles fall out and just hit the, the ground or the duct, the bottom of the duct. The next biggest size, they don't move with the air very well and they can just run into a fiber. And that's called impaction. When you get bigger than that, the particle can go with the airflow, but it's big enough that it hits the fiber anyway. Then there's diffusion or random motion, Brownian motion, that will cause smaller particles to bounce around in air and they just sort of accidentally hit a, a fiber. There's also the electrostatic attraction for charged fibers, particles that have charges on them opposite to the fiber will just be pulled over by you know, the, like the electrostatic forces. This, all of this means is you add all the different mechanisms that can work on your different sizes of particles together. And in some, you get something that looks like the black line here, which shows a uh, most penetrating particle size for, this one was based on some single, single fiber efficiency numbers, but you're basically in the 0.1 to 0.3 micron size ranges where you're likely to get your lowest point. But this is showing you that it also gets, you, you get more collection both above and below that. Um, and I happen to not have any MERV-13 filter data that had the lower size particles. So this is a MERV-14 filter da data set that I took oh, a few years ago, just showing what the curve can look like for a real, you know, on the market, um, MERV-14. So one of the things I wanted to point out before we get into the more or less advice section, there's two ways of looking at doing your filtration or your air cleaning. Either you're looking at removing or inactivating particles in the air just because then they won't be there anymore. Or you're looking at using getting more clean air to dilute the, uh, the concentrations in the air so that the person breathing in would get a smaller dose or you know, just not breathe in as many different virus laden particles. Um, so it's really the same thing, but if you look at it from both directions, it can tell you why this could be very important. Um, also noting that early on with the ETF, most of our advice was turn off your HVAC. We don't know if it's gonna set, you know, send the virus to various locations and hurt people. They said, use only outdoor air. Well, over time, of course, we learned a little bit more that you know, masks were more important than your air filter. Um, and we remembered that as we hit summer that we needed to be sure that people could have air so that they wouldn't be too hot and then in the winter too cold. So we backed up, you know, use enough outdoor air to meet code and more if it's nice weather for you and the air outside is clean of other things. Um, but take into account that you have to use your temperature and humidity to be comfortable and, you know, just productive. Um, note about my content, the slides that have bat white backgrounds are taken directly or very closely based on what's actually up on the ASHRAE website. So I've used a different background just to not claim it as being my original content. And two pictures of filters just because. This is the page, the front page for the filtration disinfection. I just put this up to show you that we have a lot of different topics. Many of them I'm not hitting on today, but if you're interested in the other topics, go to the website and read the page. Um, and again, I want to make sure everybody does understand this is a group of people that got together and did our best to put advice together. This is not 
legal documents, it's our best recommendations. Um, they do change. They are not mandated unless somebody you know, does it separate from ASHRAE. So um, this basically is up here to say that um, take care. There could be some risks associated with handling filters, but standard PPE should work fine. Don't be, be massively afraid of your filters. Um, just wear um, disposable gloves, eye protection. And as soon as you pull the filter out, put it in a bag, close it up and get rid of it. Don't do the normal sitting it in the corner and come back in a week. Um, so one of the things we were asked early on is how do we feel about um, leaving filters in longer so people don't have to worry about touching them. And the answer that we came up with is that it's fine to leave filters in longer, if you, especially if you're in a location where you already know that you don't normally hit a high enough pressure drop in your normal change out time. You know, if you normally have filters that are pretty clean when you pull them out a year, leave them for an extra month or two. It's not going to hurt your system and they should still function as well, or at least pretty darn close. Um, there are some suggestions for if you want to disinfect the filters, but I don't know if anybody's actually doing it. Putting it in the trash bag should work fine. Wash your hands when you're done. So modes of transmission. The COVID-19 is thought to mainly spread from person to person through respiratory drop, that big stuff that gets breathed out and hits people, gets in their mouth, gets in their hands and then to their face. That's the, the part you need to worry about the most. After that, we do believe that there is some at least aerosol transmission. There's less proof for that. Um, but a lot of infectious viruses and you know, other diseases have been proven, usually after the big scare, to be able to be transmitted through the HVAC. So for people who want to take care and try to keep things clean in terms of moving the virus other places, filtration and otherwise take care of your HVAC. And whatever you do, if you're if you're um, diluting what's with what's near the people, that's good for lowering doses. Um, two statements on airborne transmission, basically saying that we think it's likely. Um, so mechanical air filters. This is what most of the people I think at NAFA probably think of when they think of filtration. Our recommendations for mechanical air filters and Noting that this doesn't even say it's a recommendation, it just says MERV, you know, MERV greater than 13 are efficient for capturing airborne viruses. And note, it doesn't say perfect, it says efficient. Um, MERV 14, of course, would be better. HEPA would capture more. Um, one of the things that we put up is the note that some of the filters have electrical charge applied to the media, and therefore maybe a MERV 13 when you put it in, but a much lower efficiency later on. So I recommend that you use a MERV A if you can get it as the rating. Um, if you can't use the MERV 13, because even if it drops, it's likely to be better than a MERV 11 that also would, would drop. Um, this is one of the reasons why we say that the um, MERV 13 filter is efficient. It's required to be 85% at the one to three micron range, which is at least where a lot of us believe the majority of the the virus laden particles will be. And 85% isn't perfect, but it's a lot of it. This is a chart that we put up to come up with some idea of if you don't have the MERV rating, um, you know, what other numbers can you use? And basically if you're looking for a MERV 13, use an EPM1 filter if you just have the 16890 rating or a PM sub 522 that didn't get subbed in my slide, but in the 75 to 100 range. And again, if you use this table with the MERV A instead of MERV, you'll get better correspondence because the, the different tests test different things. Another set of questions that came in a lot early on was, wouldn't HEPAs be the only things that would be effective? And that was mostly from people looking at 70 nanometers on the charts and saying that they, they needed 100%. So not only are you actually looking in a bigger size range, you're also... Um, not necessarily requiring 100% efficiency because 
that's not remotely practical for most places. Um, HEPA filters have a lot of, well, you can't just stick a HEPA filter in a system without putting in casing, putting in new fans. There's a lot of reasons you can't, but we put this in to show people what that what the HEPA filter does and how it compares to general MER filters. And this is my red dash box showing, you know, if you're looking at a MERV 13 filter, MERV 14 filter, they're up in the high end of efficiency by the time they get up to the size of, or to within that box. And another slide on HEPAs. The advice here that we came up with is because a lot of people, and remember we're trying to give practical advice, not heavy duty retrofits or design your new building type advice. If you can't put a HEPA filter in, if you can't put a higher level MERV filter in, there's some other options. You can look at in-room or portable HEPA air cleaners or high MERV filters, pre-assembled systems. There's other ways to get that filtration into your space, possibly only into one room. But remember that if you can't do one option, there's other options that you can look at. And sometimes you'll need more than one option, but you can improve your situation. Nothing will be perfect, but improving it is likely to be beneficial. For one thing, if you catch more of the PM 2.5, you've reduced your PM 2.5 in your room and that's good for breathing. Um, this is another explanation for part of why we um, thought that the MERV 13 was a good place to go. Besides being above 50% in the the lowest sizes and 85% are better in the medium sized particles. Um, this is a paper and I'm sorry the graph is bad, but it's the copy of the picture that I had. Um, it shows for, um, I believe this was um, yeah, influenza risk reduction, that there was a pretty stunning bend in the curve at MERS 13 where the efficiency, the efficacy didn't go up as much for the cost. So that lent us to kind of feeling like a MERV 13 was a reasonable suggestion. So moving on to other types of filtration, there's the electronic air filters and um, big ASHRAE doesn't define them quite the same way as some of us, but basically there's other types of air filtration. You can use an ESP type precipitator. Um, there's devices that have media with charging together. Um, again, you're looking at how efficient it would likely be against the size particles or the content of the particles and whether you can put them in your HVAC system. And I keep putting in the note, you remember with the, with the regular media filter, you have to change them with ESP types. You have to you know, clean the, um, the charge plates that collect the dust. And you also need to wipe down your wires to keep them working. So they can also reduce an efficiency the same way, say a charged media filter would. UVC is another really um, good option for places, especially that adding pressure drop. You know, if your system is designed for a MERV 7 filter, putting in a MERV 13 is likely to cause you to not have enough airflow or it will cause your fan not to work, or you know, a number of different problems can come up. UVC is something that you can put in your duct and has very low pressure drop. UVC has been proven to work against um, MS2, um, which is the simulant that's used for um, most viruses. Um, if you use the type of system that's designed for induct, this is not that single bulb that you put on your coils. These are systems that are designed to go induct. You can also, with UVC, do upper air disinfection and surface disinfection, and you, they, they can be included in portable devices. Um, like filters, media filters, UVC has a long history of science and function behind it. Um, <coughs> again, it does require special PPE. You know, you need to not have the lamps where you can. You know, people's eyes will see them when they're on, but if they're in a duct, it's unlikely. Um, and th there's a link to information from the um, IES. This is a picture of a, and some more information on the induct type of UV. 
We're currently recommending a minimum target UV dose of 1500 microwatt seconds per centimeter square. Um, if you want to know more about what that means, you probably need to talk to somebody who's really into UV. I can tell you that you need to have multiple lamps and they need to be spaced out so that your whole cross section will get dosed. Um, but it is possible, but you need, do need to have somebody come in and make sure that whatever system you put in works for your, your HVAC. <clears throat> it's also recommended that you put a low MER filter up front just to keep dust bunnies and major dust out because UV will inactivate or make non-contagious the virus. It does not get them out of the air. So one of the things that we noticed um, very recently that we hadn't actually put in that you need to turn the fan on for the filters to do you any good. So this slide does not have the white background because I'm just now trying to get it put into our advice, but your filter is not gonna clean your air if you don't run the fan. General advice from the other groups like schools and um, hospitals and you know things of that sort is that you should be running the fans as much as possible when the buildings are occupied and at least three, three air changes, usually before occupancy say in the morning, but it could be after it's closed, but just to clear out the air when there's nobody there. And again, if you can't run the fan for some reason at certain times, remember that you can up your outdoor air by opening windows, say in a school or using in-room air cleaners. But take all of your options and pull them together to decide what you're actually going to do. Another option, UV upper air disinfection. This is uh, just for a single room, but you can put mount UV lights um, above eye level, you know, like eight feet up and it, will, it can kill the, I'm not supposed to say kill, it's inactivate the viruses that go through these devices. Um, it does require good mixing and decent design, but it is another option if you want to say, control a waiting area or something where there's likely to be a fair number of people, you don't know if they're contagious and you, you just want to kind of continuously run and not have to worry about the HVAC coming on and off. And my slide didn't change, there we go. So in room or portable air cleaners, and again, probably everybody here knows about these. Um, what you need to look at is overall, how many air changes per hour does your room need? Take into account if you've got HVAC already providing clean air, or you've got outdoor air coming in, say through windows, if you can figure out how much that is. But you basically need to take the CADR, which ought to be given with a unit, which is basic, it's essentially an airflow rate times removal efficiency. I would say not exactly, but it's close enough. But if you take your air changes per hour, they will equal your CADR times 60 minutes per hour and divided by the room volume. Very basic. Then you can figure out from that what CADR you need for a device that you want to purchase. Or if you want to purchase more than one device for the same space, you know, split it. You, if you need 300 CFM, you can get 250 de devices and put them in different locations and spread out the air. Um, air change recommendations. I have heard all sorts of things and there's a lot of discussion going on with the ETF and I think other people, but um, today I talked to somebody who was recommending 12 air changes per hour. I've mostly heard three to 10. I believe 10 is often used for healthcare. I've been telling people that five or six seems to be reasonable. We're still looking at data that could change, but um, you know, I would say don't go below three and probably try to aim people towards six at least. Um, air changes instead of filter efficiency. This is just Kat, um, Kathleen's version of how to think through what you need. Figure out how much, how many air changes per hour you want. Get your volume of your room and you can use the square footage times of guess at your ceiling height just to get a good guess. If you can't figure out your outdoor air, use zero, but otherwise figure out how much outdoor air you've got coming in and then kind of reiter or do iteratively how much airflow you're getting from your HVAC times your filter efficiency if you're looking at changing your filter type or adding room cleaners you know any of these different things can be used to meet your goal of getting enough clean air in your room summary it's likely that COVID-19 is spread through the air Air cleaning can help mitigate disease transmission by removing the virus and by diluting it in the air. 
The options for air cleaning include HVAC systems and in-room devices. Um, the filters that are recommended by the ETF, and remember this is advice, are the mechanical air filters, electronic air filters or air cleaners, and UVC. Care and judgment should always be used if you don't know already what you're doing, and especially if you're adding like UV to your system, you need to have somebody who understands what they're doing. Um, and please, if you're adding filters or changing your filters, do look at what it does to the overall airflow through your system. Um, you want to keep the air flowing. Um, one of the things I tell people with homes is if you change your filter without thinking about it and suddenly your AC is running 24 seven, you're probably not getting air through your filter. Cut back on it. I mean, you know, go to a lower mirror filter or go find one that's got a lower air pressure or a pressure drop. The most important takeaways, even though I didn't talk about them much, wear your mask. The ETF information is advice and not rules. We have no solutions that are perfect. And you know, you're, if you catch it, it's still more likely it's gonna be from somebody you're close to. But we do believe that small improvements are better. Make an attempt. You know, don't give up. There are options out there for everybody. Filters can remove the virus and other particles, of course. Diluting with clean air reduces your dose. And if you have questions, there are places to look and people who will try to help. The, here's the ASHRAE ETF website. Um, I think I talked faster than I meant to, but um, you can email the COVID-19 at ASHRAE.org to ask the whole group questions. The questions will be funneled to the group that they think would be most likely to answer it. And if you want to email me, um, assuming you don't end up in my spam filter, I will do my best to um, point you in the right direction. And I also want to say to each person listening to this talk, if people are out there asking questions, give them answers, point them to the website. Also point them to CDC and WHO and other places for the medical end of things, if that's what they're looking for. The ASHRAE website is HVAC, filtration, how to use your mechanical air system. We are not the dose people. We are not the you know, how to treat it, which medicines to take. We are just the, me the mechanical equipment end of things. Um, but so get the word out, point them to us if they have filtration questions. I think um, a number, a lot of people are getting online and their Facebook groups for their school systems and saying, go read the ASHRAE website for filtration information. It's a good thing to do. Uh, that's the end of my planned talk. Uh, I talked faster than I meant to, but there were a lot of questions. I hope some, I hope I answered a lot of them, but I suspect there's still some more. All right, all right. Um, Kathleen, I'm back, and I, we got about 15 questions in, um, and then we have also a list of quite a few that were pre-submitted, but some have been uh, resubmitted um, in the question and answer. Um, First, we'll start at the, uh, the beginning. Uh, ventilation standard 6021 has a calculation method available that says you can lower outside air if you are using an air cleaner. Wouldn't it be a good time to repeal that due to the pandemic, mandating ventilation and, and uh, stay at code or higher? Um, I, let's say this is Kathleen's answer. Um, I don't think we should repeal it, but I think most people should probably err on the side of putting in more outdoor air if it's practical for them. Um, that's because in most areas, outdoor air is unlikely to have COVID in it. Um, with regard to any other contaminants, it still seems like a rational approach to me. You know, if you're cleaning the air, as long as you're keeping the, the bare minimums going, but I'm not, at this point, the ETF is looking into things that we might want to change going forward, suggestions we might want to make coming out of this for what we're thinking of as being, being to be prepared for the next pandemic. But we're not there yet. We're still dealing with this one. But I do suspect that there will be changes to at least some of the documentations to say, you know, in the same way, you might want to prepare for a 
hurricane or you know something like that sort um that you would be building buildings or having your buildings prepared that you could relatively easily get ready if something like this showed up again i suspect we will have changes like that into you know if it's, if not the codes into the optional appendices hopefully that came close to answering I, I guess I can also add a little bit of that from my ASHRAE background. Changes to a formal standard like 62.1, which is ANSI approved, takes months, if not longer. So yes. they can't formally change that without going through public review, you know, and publication and, and things like this. So changing that standard is not is is not a quickly or easily done thing um, under the circumstances. So very true. Uh, another next question. Um, question on mass uses, uh, CDC study uh, or has a study in May of this year regarding influenza transmission and face mask use. We did not find evidence that surgical type face masks are effective in reducing laboratory confirmed influenza transmission, either when worn by infected persons sort by source control or by persons in the general committee to reduce susceptibility. However, as with hand hygiene, face masks might be uh, able to reduce the transmission of, of other infections and therefore have uh, uh, value in an influenza pandemic when healthcare resources are stretched. If you want to read that, Kathleen, it's in the question and answer. I think I need to, yes. I would have to say for this one, I'm not a health expert. All I know with the masks is what I've read and what I've been told. And, you know, I'm quite willing to believe, say, the CDC and other people who are saying that that they work. Um, the One of the reasons I believe that they work, even the relatively flimsy ones, work to some extent because if you remember that picture of the woman coughing, that those big glops, even if your filter doesn't catch little particles, it can catch that stuff and then it dries in your mask near you. And if you're the one that's infected, that means it's not getting to other people. And the worst it would do is gross you out. Um, but it will keep a lot of that wet gloppy stuff from getting out into the air and drying down to where it could get to other people. Okay. Um, moving on to one that was kind of a generalized question. Um, someone's saying you, they use MER13 and have di here different replacement periods. We've also got a question regarding HEPA. Um, what are the suggested periods to follow to change filters? Other than the suggestion that if you have low dust loads that you could leave your filters in longer than normal, the um, ETF has not been recommending changing change outs. Um, there's so many variants of different filters that it would be kind of unwise for us to say that, you know, MERV 13 has to be changed at certain times because different dust capacities and different square footage and all that um so in other words i don't i don't have an answer for that other than do, do what you would normally do um, we okay. don't with the virus you don't have the issue of the virus getting on your filter and growing through it you know it's not like you're catching mold and you have to worry that you've got a wet environment and you're going to be getting mold spores downstream Um, let me find, sorry, thank you. Um, there is, um, one of the questions came up about CADR in your presentation. Um, and I don't, this may have come from the epidemic task force, but, uh, do you know which of the three CADRs you, uh, they're referencing? Um, I believe most of the people are doing the ones that's just for the straight particles, but, at least from the ones that I've seen, they're often fairly close. If it were me and I was making the decision, I would use whichever one was lowest. But so no, the ETF does not have standard recommendations. We are 
Uh, we currently have a group of us working on some guidance for choosing in-room air cleaners, but we haven't got the document ready yet. We're still fighting over things like that. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a lot of questions re regarding uh, ionization, bipolar ionization. Um, the, the one that's in the Q&A, but I will I'll get to a, a few pointed questions. Is there a valid authorized long-term safety data on ionization yet? Um, where could they find this? Um, also, what is um, somebody had asked? Why is uh, the epidemic task force recommending BPI without a um, a a test method re regarding them? And uh, did ASHRAE have a formal stance on them? Okay, the one let's see, that's several questions. We had one time where a draft that ha hadn't been meant to get out that had a BPI was recommended in one page got through and got posted and it shouldn't have. There is should not be a recommendation on BPI within our documentation. We do find that occasionally we make state mistakes when we post things. Um, um, but because I figured that might come up, I brought along the, the things that weren't quite filtration. Um, what we have said is basically that we do not have convincing scientifically rigorous peer-reviewed studies or you know, third-party independent lab tests that give us enough guidance to recommend these types of devices or to say that we don't recommend them. It's we've had to leave it up to the manufacturer. There's several reasons for this. One of them is even if you just take bipolar ionization, there's many different devices and there's not enough information out there to say that they all work the same. And I mean, the manufacturers say they don't. Um, so it's very hard to count them as a category, but mostly we can't find the data um, we have been looking, if anybody does have data that fits into this category, we would like to see it. Um, we also are recommending that you talk to the people, look at your, the manufacturer's data, be sure that any data you look at gives you information on efficacy, what happens to the virus, um, what kinds of stuff comes out of the units that could be harmful. I'm not saying they are harmful, I'm just saying you need to have information on it. But some of the systems do emit ozone. Many of them don't, but a lot of people do at least have that data. If you're gonna look at BPI, corona discharge, any of these other devices that we just don't have the history with, you've got to look at the data. And maybe if you're buying it, you can get more of the information than I have been able to see. Um, the other thing is, Yes, we don't have a test for it, but we have been trying. We have really been working over the last six or eight years to try to get testing. So I would ask people, if you're trying to buy these products and the people say we don't have a test, ask them if they've ever heard of ASHRAE and ask them to come and help us write the standards because we need to get standards that apply to the devices, will be accepted by the people and give us good information. And we need volunteers to do the writing and to bring the intellectual oomph to it. And the other statement I have on the CDC basically saying the same thing. There's, you know, they say it's not to imply that the technology doesn't work, but there's an absence of an established body of evidence reflecting proving efficacy. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. That's a long answer Thank to, you. well, a not short question. Did I hit each point? Um, uh, well enough, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a few questions on um, um, filters to uh, microbial resistance, uh, specifically copper and silver ions embedded in the media and antimicrobials in general. Um, what are basically asking your your thoughts on it? Not um, and is actually making any recommendations? Right. I have not seen like modern test data on things that are currently available. What I can speak to is somewhere in the order of 20 years ago, and honestly, I don't remember if it was 15 or 20 or 25, but there was there were a lot of antimicrobial 
products put out that were put on filters. Karin Ford and some other folks at RTI did a study, it's available through the ASHRAE technical portal if you're a member of ASHRAE on antimicrobials. And what we found was that as soon as a dust cake was on them, you know, as soon as the filter got a little bit dirty, whatever the filter had been treated with couldn't get to the microbe, you know, whatever live or semi-live thing was on it to do anything. So it seemed to be good as long as the filter was clean, but as soon as you put a dust cake on it, they didn't work. My best guess would be that, that we would see the same thing now. I don't, I don't have data to show that that's true though. If you can't find the, the citation, send me a note. I will find it for you. <laughs> uh, the study that was done, by the way, was, uh, uh, I believe it was Ashbury Research Project 909. For those yeah. looking for that. Um, I've got a lot of a lot of questions, Kathleen, regarding 522. Um, I have one that says, is MERV, a, MERV 8A performed better than MERV 13? I've got a couple of questions asking if, um, 522 is considering a, uh, adopting Appendix J fully, um, which is the conditioning step, which is different than yes. the ISO method. Right. Um, and is, is, an a, is a filter with an A rating better than just a standard 522? Okay. Um, the first part, at least that I remember, does a MERV 8A perform better than a MERV 13? Probably not, because that's pretty far apart, but so much of it depends on how fast it gets dirty and how fat, well, how much it's exposed to, so that how fast the drop-off occurs in the efficiency versus any increase. Um, it's, it's a tricky question to answer at what point are they equivalent because different filters act differently and different buildings are, are different. So. I don't have a straightforward answer to that question. Um, with regard to is 522 considering bringing Appendix J in? Um, I'm the chair of 522, so I don't bring motions to the floor. We are always, I mean, anybody can come to the meeting and talk about something. I mean, I, we've got, you know, if we have time in the meeting, there's space on the agenda for, you know, what do you want to talk about? Um, Anybody on the committee could bring it up as a topic and look for a vote or a discussion on voting on it any time. It has not been brought up, I want to say, three or four years. It definitely hasn't been during my time. I don't remember it being on the It was. It was officially, months. it was, yes, it was officially on mine. And at the time it was uh, voted, it was voted, or voted to not approve. It did not pass. Right. So the motion was to move it fully. I do wonder if it will come up because of the COVID situation. I've had several people call me and say they're interested in discussing it again. But there are a lot of people that don't want to have the test get longer and more complicated. Um, so I, I don't, I suspect if it came up for a vote, it would be relatively close, but it would lose, but I don't know. Um, we'll, I guess we'll and, see in January if it comes up. And Kathleen, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is a couple of studies going on research between oh, here yes. and the, and Europe, comparing the two different discharge, discharge conditioning methods and their repeatability, correct? Yes, and I didn't even think about that because, um, um, RP1784 has Appendix J as one of the things that we've got different labs running them to see if they're if it's repeatable, because that's something we don't really know at the, this point. So if that turns out good, there'll be more of an impetus to add it in. And um, I'll definitely be looking at the European data, too. I'm sure somebody will bring it to the meeting. So was there any was there a third part to that question? Uh, you answered the third part. OK, good. Oh, you got it. So. Um, it was um, it was mentioned in your presentation. Uh, HEPA filters should be sealed. Uh, should we recommend that all HVAC filters be sealed to prevent by possible? I was going to start the presentation with that statement, and I forgot again. 
for some reason, we, we assumed it on the ETF that everybody would seal them and would know that that needed to be done, and we didn't put it in. So I'm working on getting it added to the ETF website. But yes, if you want the filter to work the way it's supposed to work, it's got to be sealed in. Um, and yeah, it's got to cover the opening that the air goes through. Yes, please, everybody seal your filters. They don't, you know. Your 10% bypass is much worse than getting a MERV 11 instead of a MERV 13. You know, it's, please seal them. Um, I will update my presentation. <laughs> next one I have for you. Uh, FYI, in Thailand, we have a local code uh, to set the safety distance exhausting from a negative pressurized room uh, uh, a A I I R room. Uh, if we do not use HEPA and UVGI for exhaust, is that something that the epidemic task force should be considering? Um, I would think that considering would be a good idea. I don't know what advice there is in the. Um, there is a section on the ETF that I haven't read as thoroughly as I could have on health type facilities, there may be guidance in there already. Um, I don't remember seeing it, but it could be there, but that would be where you would look for something specific like that. Cause that's the venting of them in the, the organization. And it's, I mean, other than to say that you need negative pressure to help contain things, I, that's outside of my knowledge. Um. This for so we're all aware we have about ten minutes left of the presentation time a lot of time frame so we'll try to get through as many questions as we can if if we don't we will try to follow up with those um, direct questions afterwards um, but keeping moving along though um, for healthcare facilities uh, who may be generating aerosols would you recommend source capture uh, or ambient cap cleaning both depending on the space. Um, I'm not a health facility expert. The group that's doing that has separate you know, suggestions for how to apply the things from the filtration and disinfection to healthcare on their section. Personally, because of knowing things about sources and control, but not hospitals, I would think that if you had regions where you knew there were gonna, there was were going to be a lot of sources, which would mean sick people, that you would want to have local source control where you can, and every place else you would want to have at least the the general HVAC in large part to get that clean air into spaces. But go read the, the hospital section. If you don't find your answer, send in the question and we'll get those folks to answer it, possibly with, with some of the folks from my group helping. Um, uh, okay. Thank you. Um, a, a, a very direct question. Um, whose idea was it to mandate schools change to MERV 13? Was it from the it's epidemic task force? CD? It's okay. not mandated. It, it's advice. It's a suggestion. Um, and the filtration group in conjunction with the whole greater ETV hierarchy or ETF hierarchy Selected MERV 13 is their suggested level to go to to be beneficial. Um, the schools group has put in suggestions for how to work to using MERV 13 or other suggestions for getting clean air in the space when you can't do it. We are very aware that a lot of schools can't handle MERV 13, which is why one of the reasons we say it's advice. But if you can't handle a MERV 13, there are other things you can do. Again, bringing in outdoor air in good weather where you have windows, putting in in-room air cleaners, adding UV, C. Um, so I want to just, everybody take away from this. The MERV 13 is advice. It's not a mandate. It's not a law. It's not statutory. It's our best advice at this point in time for this crisis. Sorry, um, <laughs> I don't want anybody to be saying we're going to get sued because Ashray said this. That's not the way this is working. It's supposed to be helpful advice. Um, moving on a little bit, just 
um, thank you. <laughs> what is the um, what is the uh, is there an institute that certifies HEPA or other filtrations? Uh, is IUST the the method to be followed? Uh, many manufacturers do not list what protocol it followed to test their filters, especially with portable air purifiers. Um, I think you probably could I, answer that better than me. I I, I probably could. Um, there there are three. There are the, the IST method uh, recommended practice one um, references multiple types of of HEPA filters. You also have the EN uh, eighteen twenty two standard. Right. Um, those are for the individual f filters um, themselves. Those are the, typically look, what you're looking for, the methodologies um, within that and what their levels are, uh, if, if somebody's labeled it with it. Um, as far as portable air purifiers, um, I think you mentioned it earlier, uh, the filters are not, they're important, but looking at the CADR rate right. is, is also very critical as well. The AHAM test method that gives us the ADR, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, sorry. Uh, do you have advice for, for exhausting air? <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm here to help. Do you have advice when exhausting aerosol outdoors uh, to render the air safe? I don't. Um, so far, people have been assuming that there wouldn't be people standing around your outlet. Um, if that's not the case, I would think you would need to do filtering, but it isn't something that we've really worried about. Um, it may be an oversight thanks. that we should fix, but it's something we haven't been worrying about. Um, so uh, another one back, kind of back to HEPA for ASHRAE 52.2 test uh, up to MERV 16. How about HEPA filters MERV 17 through 20? Do ASHRAE continue to update this, or uh, or do they recommend to stay with IEST? ASHRAE does not include MERV 17 to 20. It was a section that was put in a, ref, a suggestion for how to think about HEPA filters back when we first started the method. It was never intended to be actual signing MERS. It's no longer in the method. It's been gone for years. Um, and even when it was there, the recommendation was if you wanted to use higher level filters, use HEPA filters at different levels. And I don't remember what the specifics were, but it was IEST methods or similar that were recommended. So if you hear MERV 17, tell the people what they're talking about is that they want a HEPA. It might be one of the 99.95 versions of HEPA instead of 99.97, but it's something that's outside the purview of 52.2. And it's also outside the purview, by the way, of, of ASHRAE as far as the test methodology. Correct, correct, good, good point. So it's handled by IEST, ISO, and um, and the European Normalization Union Group. Right, so, correct, yeah. Um, what about uh, recommending use of air monitoring, uh, air monitoring to show the air is clean and healthy? I'm not aware of an air monitor that does real-time COVID detection. Um, if there was such a thing, I think it would be a, Good idea if it wasn't vastly expensive. Um, other than that, that's something that's outside of um, my world. Um, I know that there are suggestions and research going on for like, should you use CO2 as a surrogate or something else? But that's not something I've dealt with, especially with related relevant to COVID. Um. One from from before uh, this turn in. Uh, what quality of air filter would you recommend for home use uh, now, and why? I recommend that people look at their system and try to figure out what they could manage. Um, my home has a system that comes with a MERV ten and a optional filter that's a MERV thirteen that supposed to work with the same system in the fan. For me, I think I put the MERV 13 in, although actually it's sitting on the stairs and I need to put it in because I got a new one just recently. Um, for people who currently have something like a MERV 6, they probably can't upgrade. And the answer would be if they have, say, a flat panel, see if they could up, you know, from a, a flat panel MERV 6, they probably could take a, 
a lightly pleated Mervator tent. Um, my suggestions, and I don't know how good they are, but they're the best ones I could come up with, were to tell people that if they put the, the new filter in and it looks like it's being sucked through the hole, you, that's it's too much pressure drop. If your fan keeps running all the time and you're still not meeting your temperature control, you're not running enough air, you've got too much pressure drop. Um, so I would like to see people get to MERV 13. I don't think it's very possible for most people. But a lot of people, at least in temperate climates, can open windows. If you don't have too many allergy problems, or you know, you can do that. A lot of people who think they might have a sick person, but they don't know for sure, get an air cleaner for your living room. If you do have sick people in the house, but you're, they're not hospitalized or they're in the house, you know, close off their room, put an air cleaner in there, or put a fan in the window and pull the air from that room out so you're creating negative pressures to keep the COVID from entering the rest of the house. That's not an answer to the what to put in your HVAC, but it's a way to use your fan and your air movement to help. But homes are tricky because a lot of them do not have good fans. Um, do what's reasonable will, and pay attention what result you get. I will also plug uh, another colleague of ours, uh, another researcher, Jeff Siegel of the University of Toronto, oh, who yeah. many of you know, recently published a very long, very in-depth study of 20 residents uh, and the effects of filtration on air quality. Um, that should be available on the ASHRAE website now uh, and is a very good read. I believe I, he also did a, um, a short write-up a, a few months back on uh, the same subject, so within the ASHRAE journal. So both of those should be available um, online if somebody's looking for it. Uh, that being said, that takes us right up against uh, 5 o'clock. Tony, I'm going to uh, – we, we, I think we're just out of time. I'm going to turn it back over to you, though. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Kathleen. Very informative. A lot of information to be uh, soaked in there. So know everyone that the PowerPoints will be available in a day or so on our website. If you go to our website, um, you'll see a COVID-19 menu item. And there we have all of the webinars that we've done related to this subject, of course. And uh, you'll also see all the recorded webinars there as well. And we will put that there. Uh, I shared out the link where it will be, but it doesn't look like it's very easily copy pasteable. So just go to NAPAHQ.org and you'll find the recording here in a, in a day or so and the, the PowerPoint. So, and so you might want to watch this again because there's a lot of information. So thanks so much, Kathleen and Mike. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kathleen. And that concludes the webinar. If there's any other any other questions, Kathleen, do you invite people to reach out to you? I don't know if your email was on those, uh, one um, of those slides I there. I think it was on the first one. Uh, is it's, it okay to share your email on yes. the... Uh, okay. I will share it's Kathleen's also, email. It's all over the place. On it's all... <laughs> and stuff, so. You're not hard to find. Okay. I'll share Kathleen's contact information. I don't always answer right away. It might take a day. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. The uh, So you can reach Kathleen through that uh, website or through the website uh, as well. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For more information about how the National Air Filtration Association's membership, networking, education, and certifications can improve your career and business, visit NAFAHQ.org.